Oh, it's indeed a privilege to be here. Here's the small world, Derby Chester Green. You worked in Nottingham. <laughs> That's where I live. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it really is a delight to be in this particular church with you. Um, we are here, there's just three of us from the North England Conference. We're here um, to join the Somme Campari starting, I think, Wednesday evening. So we're here um, to start the Campari. Um, I'm with the Pathfinder Director from our conference. I brought him along because I want him to learn new ways of doing things. See different cultures, how they operate and how they plan and do their Camperies in this part of the world. I was in Thailand four or five years ago for the last Campari. And I, I love this part of the world so much. I love you all so much. I'm back again. So thank you for having me. I really want to give my respect and honor to Pastor Wong, who allowed me to share a few moments with you. I said I was available. I'm in the country. And so he's been so kind to let me stand here. So it's a privilege under God to serve you today. Um, let's just have one more word of prayer so I can focus before I start to, uh, to preach. Father in heaven. Help me, I'm a sinner. Be with my mind, be with my mouth, and help me to do right and what is just by your word. But more than be with me, I ask that you will be with your people, that you will convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yes, in your bulletin, it's got the sermon title, A Coffin in Egypt. A Coffin in Egypt. What on earth does a coffin in Egypt have to say to us today, okay? The scripture reading is found in Genesis chapter 50, verses 22 to the end of the chapter. And Genesis, of, Genesis is an interesting chapter because it opens with life and the birth of the planet, the creation of man, but it ends with death. It ends with a funeral. It ends with a coffin down there in Egypt. So it opens with life and it ends in death. Very interesting. Let's just read. Verse 22, now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. That's old. 110 years. Verse 23, Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's son, also the son of Machir, the son and the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. That means he was a great granddaddy. <clears throat> Verse 24, Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised an oath to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Verse 25, then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear. In other words, he got them to make a promise, an oath, a promise, to swear a promise saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed, and he was placed in a coffin down there in Egypt. What on earth does that coffin have to say to us today? For 400 long years, that coffin preached a word to Israel. For more than 400 years, around 420 to 430 years, that coffin that contained the bones of that patriarch Joseph served as a powerful reminder and a sermon to all the people of Israel. I think Joseph is one of the most spectacular characters in all of the Bible. I have many favorite Bible characters, not just one. I have many. And Joseph is he's probably in the top three. Probably in the top three. And when you study the lives of the patriarchs that the Bible focuses on, you can see that there are types of Christ. That you can see, when you, look at the, when you look at the life of Caleb, for example, Caleb stood before uh, Joshua and said, give me that mountain. Jesus, before God, said, give me Calvary. That's just one example. When you look at all the patriarchs, they are pointing to Jesus Christ, the ultimate example and the wonderful one, the I am, the creator of the world. And Joseph is saying something. He's saying, God will surely visit you. God will take care of you when he does. And he'll take you to the promised land. And when he does all of those three things, I want you to take my bones with you. Don't leave me in the mighty pyramids. 
I'm not interested in the Valley of the Kings. Joseph wanted to be identified with God. And so he wanted to be identified with his people. Now I think you'd agree with me that over the years when we read the Bible stories, God's used some very strange things to preach to his people. Do you remember he used a rooster to preach to Peter? Remember that story? He used the ravens to speak to the prophet Elisha, right? Elijah. <laughs> he used a donkey to preach to Balaam. He used a dove to preach to Noah. And now he's using a coffin to preach to the people for 400 years. Dead man's bones. But today that coffin has something to say. And I just want to share with you for the next 25 minutes a few things that that coffin has to say. So I want us to listen to the message coming from the coffin down there in Egypt. Genesis chapter 50 says in verse 24, let's look at what Joseph has to say. This is the context now. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. You know, that coffin reminded the people of Israel, every boy and every girl, every parent, every grandparent, whether every professional, every not so professional, every laborer, Every administrator that walked past that coffin was reminded of their mortality. Joseph said, I'm about to, I'm 110, but I'm about to die. That coffin reminds us of each and, each and every one of us are slated for death. We are not God. And sometimes we walk around this world thinking that we are little gods. We're not even little gods. We are all going to die. It might be 50, 60, 70. Some of us might even reach 100. Joseph, 110. But we're all going to die. You know, in Nottingham, there's a cemetery. Do you have cemeteries here? Do you have gravestones here? I know different cultures do different things. And you, the, the memorial is written upon the gravestone. In Nottingham, there's a cemetery, and there's a gravestone. It's a granite, slate-looking gravestone. And on that stone is inscribed these words, Poor stranger, when you pass me by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. And on this particular gravestone, a teenager, must have been a teenager, I don't know, took a piece of metal or a stone or a brick or something, and he scribed, some words underneath. And those words were, to follow you, I am not content until I know which way you've went. <laughs> but in the light of the truth, two things must be remembered. Yes, we are all going to die. Yes, we will sleep in Jesus. But two things must be remembered. Firstly, this life is the time of preparation to meet God. It's the only life that God has given you. No matter what Hollywood might teach you. You know, you notice all the movies coming out of Hollywood. It's all about spiritism and another world, another dimension. And this world is not the end. This is not the only thing. There's other things happening in other worlds. That's Hollywood. It's Gnosticism. When you see the movies, it's, it's, putting, it's, putting, it's putting Jesus in the place of the devil and putting the devil in the place of, of Jesus. Truth becomes error and error and lies become truth. That's Gnosticism and that's what's being pumped out of Hollywood. This is the only life we have to be preparing to meet God in eternity. Some people say, well, I'll do it before I die. I'll wait. It's okay. I'm enjoying the affluent lifestyle. I'm working at the bank. Don't have to be so faithful right now. I'm only 40. I'm only 30. The second thing that the coffin reminds us is if we're going to give our life to God, we do it now, today, and we have to serve the Lord and get about faithfulness and serving the Lord. Be faithful. The Bible makes it clear it's foolish to bank on the hope of tomorrow because tomorrow might never come. A good friend of mine just all of a sudden dropped dead. He was 53 years old. 
He was one of the best evangelists I've ever known. Planted so many churches. I mean, there, were, there was baptisms, baptisms, baptisms. And he was giving glory to God. I'm not praising him. It was God working through him. He would have small groups in his home. And, 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 and half the baptisms come, coming from that district were coming from his home. He was a living missionary. Dropped dead at 53. They did an autopsy. He liked his, he liked his fast food. Elder, he liked his McDonald's. Do you have McDonald's here? He, he, he had his Kentucky Fried Chicken. Do you have Kentucky Fried Chicken here? He liked his fried food so much that when they did the autopsy, they found that his coronary artery was like 98% blocked. And, and, and he was just inside, just fat, clotted up. 53! Just came back from playing a game of basketball. Had a heart attack, dropped dead. 53! Tomorrow might never come. And go get your cholesterol checked. <laughs> the second thing that the coffin has to say to us is this. The Bible reads, I'm about to die, but Joseph doesn't stop there. He says, but God will surely what? God will surely take care of you or come to you. God will surely take care. I'm reading from the new um, from the American Standard, um, what is it? The NS, New American Standard Bible. So it says here, God will surely take care of you. As Joseph lies dying, he's impressing upon his hearers the truth that one day God himself will visit the people of Israel and he will deliver them from Egypt and take them to the promised land. This was their blessed hope. This was their present truth. Joseph wanted the coffin to remind the people whenever they saw it that Goshen was not all there was. The deliverer would come. But remember, this was before captivity. This was while they were living in prosperity. And God has blessed Israel. God blessed Israel then. And God is still blessing Israel now. When you know, when you, when you, when you're looking um, in society, no matter which country you live in, I, I live in the UK, and, and when you see, when you see where the Israelites today, the Jews live and dwell, it's it's in the it's in the affluent areas of the city. God has blessed them. They they're industrious, they're entrepreneurial, they're at the top end of the economic ladder, and that that is the blessing of God. Praise God. In the land of Goshen, they were selling chariots to the Egyptians. They were importing the silks and the fine linen from around, the, from around the nations. And they were selling them to the Egyptians. Goshen was a beautiful place. It was like the Beverly Hills of Egypt. That was Goshen. But Joseph was reminding them, it doesn't matter how wealthy you might become, how esteemed you might be among men. Do not forget who you are. God is coming to take you to a better place than Goshen. And so many of us can get distracted with the things of this life. We get so engrossed and embroiled and, and, and so taken in by the attractions of this world. Even Seventh-day Adventists. Absolutely. And the coffin is reminding us, Jesus is coming soon. Don't bank all your hope on the paycheck at the end of the month. Don't bank all your hope on, 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 on getting married. Don't bank all your hope on, on getting that mortgage in that big, huge apartment at that tower block where everybody wants to live. Jesus is coming again. Joseph never forgot who he was because he remembered the promise given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abraham, Leave your country, Leave your, leave your family and leave your father's house and go to a country that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and it shall be a blessing. Joseph was looking for a better land. Joseph was second to the king. That means he was the prime minister or the grand vizier. Joseph was second to the king. Second in command in the kingdom. He was rich beyond measure. Power to rule. Joseph was powerful. Wherever Joseph went, he was escorted by guards. 
chariots. He had a consort. His family probably traveled with him. Joseph was so wealthy, he probably had a yacht. He probably had a yacht on the Mediterranean. He probably had a yacht down in the Gulf of Aqaba. And he probably had a yacht on the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea. He probably had a huge mansion in Luxor, Memphis, Thebes, and all those places. Karnak. Joseph had his palaces and his mansions, and he had his escort, and he, he, was, he was royalty. Joseph was powerful, but he never forgot who he was. Never went to his head. He was faithful to his God. Never forgot who he was or where he came from. Never forgot the promise. This is a true story. There was a former undersecretary of state for defense. This is the um, United States. The former undersecretary of defense for the United States was giving a speech at a large convention, large convention of businessmen and corporate heads. Now he was recently retired. And he was standing in a huge auditorium, thousands before him. And he's reading his prepared speech. And while he's talking, he took a sip out of his cup of coffee that he had in a styrofoam cup on the lectern, similar to this. He paused and he took a sip and he put it down. And he looked at the cup and he smiles. And he interrupts from his prepared remarks and he says this to the auditorium, full of corporate heads, business leaders top of the economic ladder. He says this, last year I was the undersecretary and I spoke at the same convention in this exact same venue last year. But now he's retired, remember? But last year he was the undersecretary. He said, well, last year they flew me here business class. They had, a, they had a limousine waiting for me at the airport. The limousine drove me to my hotel where somebody had checked me in, they escorted me to my room. The following morning, they escorted me back down. Somebody had already checked me out. They drove me in that limousine to this same auditorium. They drove me around the back through the VIP entrance and they put me in the green lounge. Whereupon in the green lounge, a lady came and she gave me a beautiful cup of coffee and a beautiful ceramic then he says, this year, I'm not the Under Secretary of State for Defense. I'm not. I'm not. I flew here economy class. I took a taxi to the hotel. I checked myself in this morning. I took another taxi from my hotel to this same venue. I walked through the front door just like every one of you. I made my own way to the back of the stage and I'm feeling thirsty. And I ask a janitor where I can find myself a cup of coffee. And without even looking at me, she points to the coffee machine in the corner of the auditorium. Whereupon I go over, I put my three dollars in, and I buy myself this here styrofoam cup of coffee. And he said, the lesson is this. He says, the lesson is this. All I ever deserved is a styrofoam cup. All we ever deserve is a styrofoam cup. Now some of you might do well in life. Some of you might become more successful. You might be, be able to afford the advantages. They will call you sir, they will call you madam, they will hold doors for you. They'll drive you in a car. You will be driven, you will not drive. But all of that stuff in this life is not meant for you. It's meant for the position you hold. It's not meant for you. It's just meant for the position you hold. All we ever deserve, each and every one of us, is a styrofoam cup. And when you move on, they will give those things to the next person who replaces you. All we ever deserve is a styrofoam cup. You know there's only two types of sinners in this life. They are sinners saved by grace and sinners with no grace at all. We're all styrofoam cup. No one deserves a porcelain ceramic cup above a styrofoam cup. We are all styrofoam cups. My point is this. When it comes nominating committee time, I notice in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I don't care whether it's South America or whether it is North America 
or if it is Western Europe or the Far East. I notice around nominating committee time, I see the human nature come. I deserve that ceramic cup. That ceramic cup is mine. It belongs to me. I'm not going to let it go. All we ever deserve is a styrofoam cup. Let it go. All you are is a steward. A steward. Holding that position. It's a gift of God. It's a privilege. And you're just a steward of a position for a period, whether it's a one-year term in this church. Maranatha, do you have one or two-year terms? Two-year terms. It's a stewardship position for two years. There's no such thing in this church, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, there is no such thing as re-election. No such thing. It's a myth. Re-election. You're elected for a two-year term of office. That's all. And if, if the Lord allows you to be elected for a second term, another term of office, you're not re-elected. You're elected anew, afresh. And so if God gives you two years, and now God has given that position to someone else for two years, you say, praise God, I can take a break. Or you say, praise God, and he might give you something else to do. Another opportunity for service in a different department. Praise God. Praise God. Joseph, for all of his wealth and all of his position, never forgot who he was. And the Bible says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And when you read the context to that particular passage, it's talking about how Jesus gave up heaven to become a man and counted it nothing. It was not robbery to spend 33 and a half years to save you and me from our sins. His default position... Christ's default position was king of the universe, creator of heaven and earth. That's his natural position. And he chose to give it up for 33 years to serve, become nothing, become of low degree, the Bible says, in order to save you and me from our sins. Our natural default position, our natural default position is sinful wickedness, that's our default position. We must acknowledge that. Say, I'm a styrofoam cup. And say, Jesus, let me be more like you and be happy with my styrofoam cup. And if you're given by God's grace and his blessing a ceramic cup, never forget, all you deserve is a styrofoam cup. Humility is what Jesus is looking for. Humility. Joseph was humble before his God. And the last thing I want to say before we close is this. This passage in Exodus chapter, in Genesis chapter 50, he says, God, not only God will surely come to visit you, but bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Joseph was pointing the people to the deliverer, to the promised one, to the promised land. Joseph knew, never forgot the promise given to Abraham. We must never forget and we must know the promise. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John 14, 1 to 3 should never be forgotten. Jesus is coming to take us home. Jesus is coming to take us to be with him forevermore. In Joseph's dying words, there's no mention of the fact that, that there will be 400 years of slavery. But Joseph knew. And he gave them the coffin so that they will never forget the promise. Not only in wealth and prosperity, but in adversity and in slavery. The coffin was to remind them that Jesus is their Savior. That the Deliverer will come and take them. Take them home to be with him forevermore. So be patient, my friends. Jesus is coming soon. That coffin down there in Egypt cries out, be patient. You know, many of us have, bur have buried loved ones, including me. I buried my mother in 2003. She died far too young. She died with ovarian cancer. And they call it the silent killer in England because it, things can happen. 
you, the cancer can grow and it's unseen and it's unfelt. And, and by the time the National Health Service, by the time the doctors had spotted what the problem was, it was too late, it had metastasized. And cancer is like a satanic disease. It's where one cell in the body wants to become separate, like Satan did, right? Wants to become separate and go alone and then infect the cells. and It just takes over the body. That's what Satan intended to do. So it's, it's got the nature of sin. But my mother was dying of cancer and I couldn't understand it. She was faithful all her life. Since she was a teenager, she was baptized. And she never left God's, God's side. She never left the church. She held every position in the church, not because she was greedy for it, because she loved to serve. And there she was dying of cancer, just 67 years of old, in 2003. And I couldn't understand why God... And some questions have to wait until we see Jesus. Some questions just have to wait. And when I see Jesus, I'm going to ask him, why did you allow my mother to die when she was just 67? And the point I want to make in closing is this. My mother had just one regret in life. And she told me from when I was young, she always wanted a little girl. She always wanted a little girl. She got married to my father, and she was praying to God for a little girl. She always wanted a little girl. And she became pregnant, and she prayed, and I came along. <laughs> I came along. And of course she loved me. She, was, she wasn't, well, she was disappointed, but not disappointed. Are you with me? But she still prayed for that little girl. And she prayed, she prayed, she prayed. And two years later now, my brother came along. <laughs> but she never gave up praying. And she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed. But unfortunately, she needed to have a hysterectomy. And that was it. But she never gave up hope. She looked forward to us growing up, to her children growing up. Boys became men. We got married. My brother and I got married. And she prayed for that little girl she never had. She wanted a granddaughter. She prayed. And she prayed. And my wife became pregnant. I was, I'm the oldest one. My wife became pregnant. And out came my son. <laughs> and we, uh, 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 we didn't want to have the scan. We wanted to go the old-fashioned way, you know. Not that it's a moral issue, but we just decided, my wife and I, that we weren't going to have those ultrasounds. We, just, we wanted the old-fashioned surprise, you know. Just trusting God. And, um, and so she prayed, and my wife gave birth to my firstborn, and it was a boy. And that was the same year she was diagnosed with cancer. And so she only had one regret in life. And she was dying and she was now on morphine and she was getting weaker. And, 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 and you know with cancer it's not the disease that kills you, it's the morphine. Because it puts you in a coma to take you out of the pain. And she said just a few weeks before she passed to her rest, asleep in Jesus, she said, you know I only have one regret in life. I never saw my daughter. Never saw my daughter. And she passed away. But you know what? Your prayers can be answered even after you go to the grave. You see, God's timing is always perfect. A few months after my mother passed away, my wife conceived. Well, it was both of us. You know what I mean? It's, she conceived. And... A year, just, just, just shy of a year after she passed away, the answer to her prayer came. My daughter was born. Now friends, can you imagine on the resurrection morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and my mother is going to arise from that grave because she died in faith and in hope. Can you imagine the resurrection morning when my mother sees Jesus? She's going to be so happy. Praise God, hallelujah, my Jesus is here. But can you imagine the double surprise and the double joy when I introduce her daughter that she prayed for all of her adult life? Can you imagine the joy? And, 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 and just that beautiful experience when we are reunited with our loved ones. Some of you have parents who are calling from the grave. Hold on to your faith. 
Be strong and be patient. Jesus is coming again. My mother is crying from the grave, Pastor Hosh. She's crying to my granddaughter, Leah. Hold on, I want to see you when Jesus comes. Hold on to the faith. Don't let go of the promise given by God to the church of God. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus is coming again to take you to where he is forevermore. And friends, like Joseph, I don't want to forget the promise. That coffin does not want you to forget the promise that Jesus is coming again. And coming one day very soon. And when Jesus comes, oh Lord Jesus, when you come, I'm looking forward to seeing you face to face. I want to see that holy city. But we will have a work to do. I know we're going to be okay opening the books and looking at all of life's records. We'll be busy. But when we get to the earth made new, you know what the book of Psalms tells us? That we will build houses. We will build houses and inhabit them. And Pastor Hush, I like, I like nice things. But I might have to wait until I get my house on the earth made new. I would like to have a golden house. I would like to have a golden house with a pearly gate. I want one of those houses that are so big. You know those houses that are so big that they have to have a big drive going up to them. On either side of my drive on the earth made new, I'm going to have mango trees on one side. And on the other side, I'm going to have guava and papaya and I'm going to have all those other things. Not apples and pears like we have in England. I want mangoes and guavas and papayas. And I'm going to have my house built right next to the river of life that flows from the throne of God because God's throne is going to be on earth. God's throne is going to bring that throne down on earth and I'm going to have my house by the river of life. So all I've got to do is walk along the banks of the river of life and it'll take me to God's throne room. And I'm going to have my house by the river of life. And behind my house, I'm going to have a big lake. I'm going to have mountains and trees. I'm going to have pet lions and elephants and all of those things. But more than all of that, I'm going to have one room in that house, and it's called the Jesus room. And I'm going to invite Jesus, when I see him walking by the river, to come to my house. My house is going to have seven bathrooms, 22 bedrooms. It's going to be one of those houses. I'll wait until I get there. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll, I'll, I'll have a brand new set of wings. I can't buy a brand new car in this life. I can't afford it. I want a brand new Mercedes, but I can't afford it. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a big Mercedes badge on my wings. And I'm going to fly with my brand new wings. And I'm going to have my brand new house. But more than all of that, when Jesus comes, I'm going to sit and talk to him. And I'm going to ask him all those questions that I want to ask him in life. I'm going to wait and be patient. And I'm going to spend time with Jesus. It could be 20 years. And you won't get jealous because you can have him for another 20 afterwards. We have eternity together. Friends, why get distracted with this life? The coffin down there in Egypt is telling us to remember that we are not God. It's telling us to remember that God will come and God will deliver us from this old world and take us to a better land to be with him forevermore. Let us remember the message coming from the coffin down there in Egypt. Amen.